record starting. So we are diving into, I'm going to close all the tabs except for this. One. Uh, we are diving into um, pushing this MR forward, uh, which previously for all these GraphQL controller um, logs, or these are Prometheus uh, logs, um, the feature category, we, we don't know it um, because our current setup for feature category is static and based on just the class um, method. But GraphQL is one controller that can receive all kinds of queries. And so we have, this is an approach where we're receiving that from the client and the request. And we check if it's, you know, make sure it's not forged, make sure it's a valid value and things like that. Um, so after the fact, uh, we can now have feature categories assigned for these different, um, at these different levels. And based on Bob's um, recommendation, this is using the very cool um, application context now. And I don't know, I was not aware of application context at all before this, but um, basically, this application context is something that kind of exists throughout the, something that all of our base controllers push to and all of our loggers and other kind of, um, anything that wants to know the context of a thing reads from this. So this is like our single source of truth for things like feature category for this entire operation. And so what's really cool is now that we're, we're pushing it onto here, um, it is being read from like that feature category isn't just applied to just this web transaction metrics is even applied to like the SQL duration metrics and all those kind of things. So that's really cool. Um, where previously it would all be not owned because we were just reading it from the GraphQL controller. So it's like a global variable, but one that it's okay to use. It's like, yeah, it's like a global variable that's okay to use. Yep. There's a lot of sharing and caring going on with this thing. Um, so here's some of the immediate, uh, challenges with this. Um, let me go down and so let me show the approach that I took and let me show where, where Bob's coming, where some of Bob's responses. And I'd love to see, um, if you all have creative ideas outside of this, that would be fantastic. Um, because of the way this application context works, it's really cool. You could just application context push at any part and it's gonna and update any kind of attribute and it will update anything it's trying to read from that will look at the latest one. And at the end of the request, it cleans up that whole stack. So it's, it's pretty optimized and, I, you know, and thread safe and all of those things. So he originally was, was looking for, um, us to, okay, because of the way, nature of application context, I can just add something to GraphQL controller that looked like this. Um, like before action, I'm just going to push the feature category and just get it from the request just on the GraphQL control. I wouldn't have to update anything else. Um, but when I did this, I noticed it wasn't working. And I noticed that my GraphQL controller, this set current context was always happening before the application controller one was. So it was always being overwritten with not owned. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if you all are familiar with the ordering of how these before action stuff gets triggered in Rails based on base classes and, and subclasses or, uh, or not. Um, is it the last one to get mixed in wins? I I don't know. That would be my guess. I know. Like these are evaluated at class uh, class evaluation time. So I would assume if there's a mix in later that has a before in it or a subclass, like it's going to win over an existing one. But Rails may have something. We would should look at the docs. <laughs> Yeah, so what I was noticing, uh, I don't have Ruby mine up. I'm sorry, Chad. Uh, <laughs> um, I was noticing this set current context 
under application controller. Yeah, this was always happening first um, or not first. This was, and that's what I expected because I wanted GraphQL controller to overwrite to happen afterwards. Um, this was always happening after a uh, GraphQL controller could do its thing. And um, that was frustrating. And so then I had, so then what I did was update um, how this method gets the feature category for action. We had to update that, oh, sorry. We had to update the way this method works to use the actual request information and stuff like that. And that's the stuff that Bob was like, ah, oh, that's not quite ideal. Um, Cause this is only the GraphQL controller needs this. Uh, so I don't, I don't know what the nature of prepend versus, um, versus before is either. That. Uh, is pre-pruned around action a, a custom one? Just click through to it in your IDE and see where it's declared. <laughs> oh, you don't have it open. Yeah. <laughs> Good one, Chad. <laughs> um, Can you give a drop a link to the MR? And the yeah, chat? let me do that. Sorry about that. I should have done that. Uh, so I, I think prepend a, a around action is uh, it's a Rails. Uh, method you can use to actually what it says to prepend a callback to the list of already existing around actions and if you do for example like uh, before or around action itself it appends an action to the list so of already existing around actions so i probably want to try on so graphql controller i guess previously i was trying before action I might want to try an around action. Mm, let me try to check the Rails guides uh, about the life cycle of of a request because they, I think, they explain it how it, how how it works for controllers. Okay, um, I am going to start the GDK too, so I can be testing this out. Um, so, just in general, this. This feels like a smell that we're having to worry about the order yep. in which things are executed and the, I don't know what the root cause is, but the fact that I just said global variable, like feels <laughs> like a related <laughs> smell to that problem. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> I think the goal is to try to have implement, because there's a lot of cross cutting concerns that use this, like we do logging from various different not processes but but wildly different places and we want to know what's the cross-cutting context so it's like i it seems helpful that we have this one single source of truth for this kind of stuff right maybe the the step back that we're missing is like okay wherever this application context is handled that needs to be a single cohesive piece of code and not like scattered with these prepend. I don't know if that even makes any sense. But. So there's not many there's not many things that actually push to application context. Um, there's like in our base API controller, we push this stuff. In the application controller, we push this stuff. But we might also in like some services push just some things as well. Um, and then when you push, it'll just, whatever you push takes precedence of what was previously there and it's not gonna erase anything you're not providing to it automatically. Um, so what, <clears throat> because of that nature, the goal is that, oh, you know, I could just, you know, push feature category, you know, wherever I, wherever I wanted to and it should take precedence. Um, and so I want to do that for the GraphQL controller. Uh, um, and so I'm going to try it again. Uh, and I tried that originally, and I wasn't able to get the timing of these things right. But I am going to try it again. I'm 
reading the code right? It looks like a round happens last. I'm not sure if I'm reading that correct. <clears throat> oh, really? I don't know. Well, yeah. And that would I make sense. Find any documentation, but. I, I've added a link to the filters documentation uh, of uh, controllers, but actually from from the documentation itself, it's not clear in which order they happen. But so for example, you have the before and after action and uh, around action, and then you have the flavor of prepend. So it's all mixing. So I'm not sure about the exact order, how they are executed. So. Um, I remember yeah. seeing something similar in the in the guides or in the docs, but my my memory fails me to remember things nowadays. So, why is the application controller needed as prepend? Is that was that to fix some earlier ordering problem? Like let's, if it were just let's a round see. action and only the things that actually needed to prepend prepended? I I'm pretty sure it needs to do prepend um oh yeah it looks like we're just uh adding. probably so other things that need the application context oh yep yeah it looks like previously it was a round action and then we said no we need to pre in this yeah it makes sense so everything can have this global state it needs to be one of the first things that happens so you're doing pre pinned but your thing is getting i so i guess the question of the problem is like we we're both trying to use the same uh stage of the rails controller lifecycle, but we're back to a lo load ordering type or some other issue because they're both trying to do the earliest possible thing. Yes. Now I did before action. I did not do a round action in the GraphQL controller. So let me, let me try that out. Um, and that would be interesting. Um, so I, let me just add. Gary just said this explains it in the chat. Yeah. I, I think I found a page that I don't know if it has prepend on it. No, it doesn't. Oh yeah, it does. Prepending filters in the bottom. Oh, where would where would it? Uh, oh, oh my. Okay. Wow. The around action. So these arounds are happening after befores. Unless you yes. are you are calling prepend, so that's why we need prepend, I guess. Unless we call prepend. prepend well, so, well, so does prepend around? That's the question then. Does prepend around happen after or before a before action? And that's, I was noticing, and there's also, we run into subclasses here. Uh, Based on the top of that article, uh, no. Befores and afters are outside of around. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So okay. you would need to change yours to a round action. Before it. Well, I had before action before. This is, I'm getting confused, but I know I had before action before. <laughs> so I, I guess because before action means I'm going to go first and then they're going to go. And that's the problem. I want to go after they go. I want to go after application controller goes. I think. But here's the other thing. Uh, you bring up a really good point. We had to change this to prepend around action because we wanted to fix the context. In some cases, wasn't being set up early enough, I guess. Yeah, I think this is making sense. If you try a round action, that should happen after the superclass prepend around. Okay. All right, let's try that out. So I'm going to change this to set current context. And I'm going to add a method set current context. And we're going to do something like application context. I had it here in this comment. Yep, 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 yep. All right. Uh, cool. So I'm also going to add some puts. I'm here in GraphQL controller set current context. Um, and I'm going to add one for, oh gosh, current context. 
I'm here in application control set current context. Okay. Cool. Um, so Rails is doing its thing. I'm going to uh, tail Rails. Um, I always type tails Rails. Uh, this is the one of the rare times that I did tail Rails correctly the first time. I have half a mind to let tails rails be a valid command just to. <laughs> That's actually an MR I have on that I'm working on for the GDK. It just adds a bunch of aliases that I think should be there. <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, GDK DR. Yeah, that's pretty good. There's a whole bunch yeah. that you could probably throw in there. Oh, yeah, there's I have like 20. <laughs> Dr. GDK sounds like a super villain and some sort of weird, uh, some weird coding universe. <laughs> All right. This I can thing... avoid aliases. Otherwise I'll, I'll forget what things actually do. I, I type things out. So let me ask you then, Chad, if you go to like the rails doc and you're, so you're probably not doing this as much as I am, but if you're like, how do I test if a set has something? And I go there and I'm like, oh, there's include, or there's this other alias, like Rails has multiple aliases for almost all their methods. Uh, do you always prefer to use, you know, this is the method, you don't use the aliases for the methods or whatever? I usually do unless the coding standards say otherwise. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah, I'm not sure why languages do that, like, or libraries do that, provide multiple methods to do the same thing. Well, Matt's did it in Ruby because he wanted to be nice. It's like, <laughs> you should be able to type, I think this is it. Yeah, that's totally it. That'll work. This will work too. They'll all work. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds actually like a really scary language to me. If I'm oh. typing stuff and it's working and I don't know why, and I try changing it and that also works, that just freaks me out. It's a design philosophy for a language. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. All right. So the GDK is uh, attempting to spin up. Um, it would be amazing to uh, be able to um, unit test this, um, this kind of ordering issue or um, I don't know. You should be able to in, in in the GraphQL controller, like it's mixing in all of this, you should be yeah. able to assert that it's got the thing that it put in the, the global. That would be really cool. Context. So if I'm here in GraphQL controller spec, um, am I doing any checking for feature category here? I am not. But maybe I could post execute and see that the feature category was came from the request or something. Does that sound like a good test? Sure, if it fails without the code there, then it's testing the behavior of the class. I don't know, I don't know what I'm doing. All right, it uh, um, sets feature category from request. Maybe you say in application context? That's, this is really like the point of this. Like, did we put the right thing in the application context? Yep. Yep, yep, yep. So let me just get this running. Expect. Uh, now, the challenge is um, I'm pretty sure the application context is cleared um, after request. I'm going to try it out, but that's the challenge. Uh, What is it called? Um, 
current context attribute. Oh gosh, something's slowing down. To be, I'm just gonna put empty string for right now and we'll see what we get. All right, let me run this down up here. So the other end of the design language design philosophy spectrum is like Haskell, where it's like, you can't do any side effects unless you can give a coherent lightning talk on monads. Yep. Yep. Doesn't make it easy for <laughs> newcomers to programming or the language. But that's but that's what the user expects. I expect to write code and I expect it to not work. So one could argue that it's the most user friendly by matching the user expectations. <laughs> All right, are we still waiting for the GDK? Gosh, I think we are. Freaking. Which is why I wanted to start running tests. Do you use external monitors, Paul? I have one. Um, I, this is an external monitor, but I have my laptop monitor. It doesn't have anything on it. Yeah. Why? I was just wondering. Okay. I, I, do, I do Windows tab a lot or command tab on my external keyboard is the windows key um although it's completely rubbed off the on my keyboard i have two keys that are completely blank from overuse <laughs> yeah my uh my a and s and d are mostly gone oh nice hmm. yeah for me you it's... need uh you need those double shot keycaps come come join us in the keyboards channel Spend thousands of dollars. Like, oh uh, no! All I can, like, I have. Oh to no! Have. Don't show me that. I, this is all my muscle memory works. Like any other keyboard, I'm like, I don't, I don't have thumbs. What? And then my fingers don't know where to go. <laughs> so my my brother and I used to work together, and he's he's a software engineer, and we would you know pair program, sit next to each other, and um, but I use Vim, so any so pair programming and switching seats was always a challenge for him because he doesn't Vim. And he uses this like funky ergonomic keyboard thing. Uh, so, oh yeah, <laughs> that's half of it. <laughs> oh man, I can't, I, I can't do that. I can't do that. Uh, now, do, you, do you, how long have you been doing that, Gary? Uh, like only a couple months. Um, oh wow! Just because I, I, I type really badly, like not like incorrectly. Like my my uh, pointer goes to the my left pointer goes to the Y key, which is bad. And so I did this kind of as a way to correct it a little oh, bit. So I keep them really far apart. That's interesting. Yeah. That's I'm, other than the function keys, I'm pretty touch type. And it's like, especially with RubyMine, it's all about the chords. It's not about sequences of commands like Vim. It's like, and so it's a little keyboard. <laughs> I, I forgot to include the, here? Uh -oh. I, I didn't do this right. I'm sorry, everybody. Um, I also don't know. Spring started now. It'll be fast. Yes. I also don't know if it's preferred to always go back to the root namespace. I always do that. I don't know if that's preferred or not. I honestly don't know. It's like, uh, like superstitious in, in Rails. Like it. <laughs> If something is going wrong, you need to do it, but not everybody does it. We don't have a, a rubber copper lint or anything for it, do we? No, and I've asked about what the preference is. My rule has been, yeah, if something's broken and that fixes it, then it goes in. But if also the file already has people going to the front for things, then I just make it match the file. That's and what that I do too. So. seems safe. Yeah, and but it's like subtle sometimes, or like when initializers start interacting with each other in some subtle way, and it only breaks like a month later for whatever reason, and then you have to track it down and add it. Oh yeah, yeah. So what what would I feel like going to the root namespace has less problems? It will never hurt. Like you can always right. uh, you can always add it on there. That's okay. a fine rule. Gosh, and I, I keep running uh, to this. I know that this is Sentinel One. I, I I'm not even gonna talk about it. I'm so frustrated with this thing. Um, I 
I got these interrupted system calls all over a GDK update at one time and was researching it. And they were like, you need to try disabling your security thing. Talk to security. And we tried a number of things. And finally, uninstalling Sentinel-1 caused it to work. So anytime I see interrupted system call, I'm not a happy camper. And, and some, I just got to rerun it. And then sometimes it works. And sometimes it just blows up again. Sometimes I have to not use Spring. Uh, okay. The expected failure or no? So now you want to put a real expectation there? Yes. I want to. Um, so I'm seeing that we ran our GraphQL set current contacts. I'm surprised that the application one didn't run. I think you want e to EQ, not to be, because to be is doing object equality. That's why it's saying string. If you did an EQ, it should compare the two, two S's. Let me know if okay. I'm wrong. Other backend people, I don't remember things. <laughs> so what I really want to do is something like this. I want to, I want to, um, uh, I want to do something like, uh, I don't know, something like this. And I want to double check this is coming from the request. Um, I don't know if this is the right way to do that. Um, uh, personally, I'm fine. It's like a little bit integration-y. You're testing, you know, the getting yeah. it out of the <clears throat> header and putting it in there, but I'm fine with that. It gives you coverage. And I spe specifically want to do that because this is the issue that I was running into before where uh, the application controller kept overwriting it. And that was, that was bugging me. So I want to, I really want to test this out this way. Um, I don't know if I can just slap headers into here. Um, Should you run it? I'll just run it and we'll see what happens. Are we finished with this? No, we're not. We're still. I probably need to. I've got a question about the definition uh, you've added to the GraphQL controller because is it is it uh, called the same way uh, way we call the other? Um, is it called set current context? So maybe we are overriding the the, the method, right? Um, it is. Oh gosh! Oh, does it? Oh no! It probably does. Yeah. Are you serious? Are the privates running into each other? Do they do that? Yeah, because oh, GraphQL okay. controller um, inherits from application controller, so you need to name it differently, I guess. But the privates shouldn't hit e hit each other, right? Oh, they do. Uh, why? Yeah, they do. Yeah. The eigen class just has these methods attached to it, and if they're named the same thing, it's going to blow away what was there before. But I think the prepend around versus around would also have been a problem anyway, even if they're named different. Yeah, but that's why you've, you we haven't seen any any puts debugging. From the application it. controller, no. that makes sense. I'm also realized I said around and I'm not yielding anything here. Um, so I, I clearly didn't do this correctly. I guess I need to yield and then I don't know what in this ensure is about, but I guess I need to just yield after I do my thing like that. Sure. Which, okay. I'm surprised the private methods hit each other. That That's always, I would expect private methods to be private. It's, in Ruby, like everything is an object. So the classes are objects, the methods are objects, and the inheritance is just like, I'm, you know, replacing this method on the, uh, wow. the class object that I have, the Even I class. And the and the protect and the accessor decorator is just you know do I th do I throw a fit if you're trying to call this from without from outside the scope or something? Right. So okay. the the visibility just uh, protects you by uh, methods being called with an explicit uh, receiver. Uh, but I think you can call self dot on methods, but like other other ones you cannot. And the same is true for the, for, uh, for the protected one. So uh, protected is protected. like just 
protected versus private is like whether you're calling on an instance or not or something like that i think protected is uh, is related to the in inheritance chains so you you can call uh, this method if you are in the inheritance chain otherwise you cannot i think i, th I think you can call protected or private inheritance but private you something about a, an instance or not i looked it up recently but it's a very subtle difference oh wow from uh from other languages that's what i would expect it's private no one can call me no one can call this except for me uh and the book protected is about the inheritance change all right so headers I'm, yeah, I'm, i think you need to set request.headers before the post call do something like this. yeah mm -hmm. i think i've done this already let me double check in this thing i think i i think i ran into this i did run into this no i did not oh yes i did okay <laughs> Let me copy this over. Like that? Yeah. <clears throat> um, and while this is running, um, I would love to get your all perspectives on this. This was surprising to me. Um, oh, wait, uh, let me see. Maybe Bob got rid of the message. Yes, 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 yes. So this is a class method. Is this a class attribute? Is the life cycle of this attribute for the entire process? What's the life cycle? So he was he was looking at this and was like, oh, this is going to load. We're going to read this file for every request. And my goal was like, I just want to run it and then memoize the value. I never have to look at it again. Um, I'm not so, entirely. So it's so it's not a class method because class uh, class variable because class variables are at edge are using the at edge but this uh, th second fact is true it is an instance variable of a class which is make it makes it uh, confusing but uh, meaning that it this instance this variable uh, holds on on the class definition so it's per process you should only see i think just one instance of it but it might have some issues regarding so for example you have multiple threads um, loading or calling the class method categories um, at the same time you might end up reading a yaml file multiple times which yep maybe not the problem but there's also and this is like i i'm not an expert on this so just yeah. hand wave calling so um if if we are um, loading the files in threads or in multiple processes which we have on, on GitLab, um uh, you, you have you have um so it increases memory anyway so it's so you, so for example you have, you have a, a puma, puma um, installation like with 16 processes you have this one loaded 16 times so maybe that's why it was just right. memory cache but this memory cache is actually per process still right so well the threads with P i think that's where it's coming from with puma it's going to load different instances of this class and so and then if i'm like tearing down i don't know I'm, I don't know what I'm talking about, but if I'm tearing down threads and spinning them back up or whatever, like, yeah, we could, I could see how we end up. I really want this to be process specific. It doesn't need, it needs to be, it should be the same across threads. Like I, I see now this might be the right thing. That was, that was news to me. And it's really interesting. I hadn't put together the way Puma could work with this. Yeah. It says the process memory stores thread safe. That's interesting. So I still think it's going to be executed multiple times. It's just going to be. So yeah, right. It is thread safe. So it's, um, if you call the methods inside a thread, 
and the thread dies, we should sh still end up having this uh, YAML being lo loaded after the thread dies. So this shouldn't be a problem, but there's also, a, um, again, hand wavy uh, memory contention or something like that. So if, if um, we should, if we read stuff from, from disk, we should do it before forking. So in a, in a, during initialization of, of Puma uh, before they start spawning uh, processes. Because otherwise you, you have those, again, hand wavy copy on write stuff and so on. So mm -hmm. uh, you, you end up uh, doing too much work if you can, could like load, load, load it up. Do it right away. Right away before the fork. So, um, and I need to look at this up. So I'm too hand wavy right now. <laughs> and, but I'm, I'm, pre I'm, I'm pretty sure and I'm writing a script right now to, to uh, load or to set an instance, class instance variable in the thread. And if the thread dies, it should survive. So this shouldn't be a problem, I think. Oh, interesting. Um, so are you are you saying that this process memory cache is probably the best, is the best approach, but adding maybe a call to categories when we first start up so that we could do this eagerly um, might be the, would be the ideal. Although we probably won't do that here in this MR, but yeah, I, I'm I'm not sure if if I agree with uh, that all categories will are being loaded per per request. I I don't understand the, this one actually. Yeah, I'll ask I'll ask about that. Um, and the only thing I can think is maybe because different environments because of Puma on on development that definitely wasn't happening, and but because of Puma maybe when things are you know threads are spinning up and spinning down i don't and you know i don't know maybe things are having to get live reloaded or torn down i don't know what the life cycle of that hot reloading kind of stuff is i don't know unless you like load it in the puma pre whatever hook i forget what it's called yeah. it's still going to be done once for every instance Puma instance on every application server. Okay. Right. Do I have that right? I don't know, to be honest. So I, th I think uh, so. <laughs> like there is a way to do it, but honestly, I, I wouldn't worry about it in this MR. Like, use use the application or the, the thread safe thing, and if multiple things read a YAML file, it's no big deal. It's not gonna break the bank. Yep. Okay. So I, I do notice here, uh, Bob asked about for that, um, uh, for the setting the feature category from the header. Um, if we don't get something from the request, let's just yield right away. And then choosing to use this with context thing. Um, this with context lets us do a push that kind of cleans it up cleans itself up when the block resolves, which is kind of cool. Uh, so I'm going to, thankfully, we have a nice little automated test for that. So I'm going to go back to this thing. And we're going to get our feature category equals GitLab feature categories from request request. And I want to. If, if this is not truthy, I want to just yield and I'm done. So I do return yield unless feature category, I guess. Uh, with context, I want to do this feature category, do end yield. Is this, is this Ruby-esque? I'm going to assume that it is. So, so the, we want to only add the feature category if, if there is one, right? Otherwise, we don't even want to write the, the key. We don't need to worry about it. Yeah. Yep. So only do this if we actually get something from the request. 
and this friend request looks like, uh, did, did you notice that command click Chad and VS code? Sometimes it works. <laughs> um, we only get this from the request if we are CSRF verified, if it's an actual valid category. Um, and um, I had to add this method because um, when I was writing unit tests for this thing, this class instance variable wasn't ever resetting itself. So this was the fastest thing for me to do. Um, but uh, with the thing that um, Bob was recommending, we wouldn't even need to call the, we wouldn't even need the reset if we use the process memory cache, apparently. Uh, so that might be cool. Um, I think I'm just going to copy what he's doing here. Personally, I have a pet peeve actually against singletons. So this is some kind of a singleton, right? It sure is. So, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna try to tell you it's not, Peter. <laughs> so personally, I I try to to avoid singletons at all costs because in the end, um, you instead of using singleton, you could just create a normal class like not having. Um, static methods at all, class methods at all. Mm. Um, and you could instead just assign an instance of this feature categories class, for example, to a constant. And then you have an in, an in singleton as well. So then it yeah. will still work. So ah, that's a good again, yeah. just just my, my pet, I, I'm not sure if, if yeah, I, I can make it clear too. So, um, so it sets providing all those reset methods. Yeah, uh, we, we just use plain good objects, I would say, yep. and yep. have yep. nice unit tests. Yep. And uh, otherwise, in the application, we use like a the default single, instance or something. In yeah, like, right. Yeah. Single yeah. instance of an object. Yep. So that's that cool. sounds like the right way to do it. Or lose um. a couple more. <laughs> yeah. So you, but um, I'm I'm up for I'm up for refactoring to do that. Um, could you help me do that? Or do you, do you think it's not worth it here? Good question. So I think it it's would worth it. I think that class variables just get, when you get into the class level and especially persisting state at the class level, it, it gets weird in Ruby at, in the, in the Slack thread for this, I dropped the subtle difference between a class variable and a class instance variable, which is what you're using here. And, you know, with Peter's approach, you don't even think about that. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is there, is there Puma concerns with, are there Puma concerns? So the, a constant is effectively uh, at the class level. So it would be the same thing as using add, add here. It's just, it's going to be more, more cohesive. You've got all of this cohesive behavior in a separate instance. It could be unit tested on its own. And as a bonus, I, I, I we could um, initialize this object when booting Puma. So all the child processes would already have the YAML loaded. So you actually you don't need any kind of caching, and you don't need to worry about um, threads. Okay, let's, so, let's let's go crazy. Let's try to do it. Um, so. If I was going to initialize this, I think its state is going to be what are all the categories, and and then maybe we can have a factory method that builds it from the YAML or something. Uh, so, how do I have class variables? How do I have properties? <laughs> do I do something like this? I don't know. Exactly. Okay. Awesome. Um, and so maybe should I? Do you think I should receive it as a set, or should I two set it here? Maybe so. Maybe we just take an array, and I can just transform it as a set here because we do want it to be a set. Uh, I'm personally, I'm fine with that. So, okay. so we'll. we'll so this is an instance variable file, just to be clear. Yes. Right thank you for that. And so then this is all going to be instance stuff. This uh, from request is going to be an instance thing. And that means we're just going to call valid because this is also going to be an instance thing. 
And this is going to look more like a factory method for something like create default. I don't know. Or lo load, load from yep. YAML or something. I don't know. I'm not sure yep. what create. Create is, um, I, I don't know. I would use load. Well, Creates an overloaded term in, in Rails. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> load active record. from YAML. You like that? That sounds good. Okay. Um, and maybe I can also have something like YAML categories, and, and I could do something like, I don't know what I'm doing. I, I have no idea what I'm doing. I, I think we don't need that. So we can actually remove the, yeah, this method completely and just move the, the loading, uh, the YAML to the, yeah, right. And then do and something then like? Just new, yeah, you can, most of the time you can omit new uh, self. Oh, and really? Actually, yeah, actually we have a cop for that, uh, which is not enabled right now. So okay. uh, it, it will warn you at some point in the, in the near future if we enable it, because it's disabled oh. due to a lot of uh, offenses we right now we have you, also in line 21 you can get rid of the self dot categories it's yes 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 and so that's actually just categories that include right yeah you can either use ads but um at gitlab i've seen a lot of uh use of uh attri attribute reader so um we like tend to, pattern. yeah we oh. tend to avoid the the ads uh, like uh, the uh, marking or like doing the instance variable thingy. So we just do in a private block, uh, Azure reader categories, and then you can use the method categories. Yeah, new line at Azure reader, ATD, yeah, reader categories. This is syntactic sugar for like- uh, I think you put a colon in front of the C. Yeah. Um, does that valid method? I don't call it all of it. it could that be private too or no? Yeah, it can be private. If it's in the private section, it will be a private adder reader. Yeah, I don't know if you're using valid anywhere outside of. Mm. Valid, um, we want to be public. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, because I think we, if we're not using it, we this whole logic is duplicated multiple times, at least in our specs that we we could totally reuse here. Okay, so this is cool um, to to benefit. How could we potentially cache this instance? Yeah, I think we have config initializers and there's a lot of going on. So one, one idea could be to create a new initializer, which just calls a load from YAML in there. And, but I need to actually, I'm not sure when uh, config initializers are being called. So, uh, called. so if, if you go into the config initializers directory, you see a lot of files over there. Yep. I'm not sure if we have something related to features already, uh, to feature categories, sorry. Or I don't know. Yeah. I, I'm, yeah, I, I would just create a new one. Okay. Or, or reuse it. I don't know. I, I'm not sure it's maybe related to, is it related to maybe metrics, right? Here, here's a crazy uh, idea. Could we, could we oh, use, well. could we use this, um, could we use this to wrap that? That's just a crazy idea. I need to understand what what process memory cache actually does. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I don't know that that's necessary. Like before we initialize it, can we go ahead and get the the constant uh, approach? Because like. The initializer is just an, an optimization. It's going to get loaded the first time a class uses the constant, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so we could actually create it. So yeah, there, there are the multiple. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I was sorry. going to say, if the constant is defined globally, it's only going to get loaded once anyway when at class evaluation time. 
Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Since we are using uh, Zeitwerk now, it should be, and and if we are using e eager loading actually, um, and we, we do this for, for production, it should be the case, yeah. So maybe, I'm not sure, so, we could either create a constant saying const like called instance in all uppercase and setting and doing like instance uh, like instance equals to uh, from load from YAML, which won't work yet because we have this load from YAML is not defined right now. We have to put it. Would this be it though? Like, is this load? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this is this person I I dislike. <laughs> It's ugly, I would say. Um, another approach would be because I really like the name feature categories actually to be used as a. So we already have an interface, which. So you are already calling feature categories dot valid feature categories from requests and so on from other places. Mm. So one one way could be to to rename this class to something else and and define the constant feature categories to the instance of what we are about to rename. So for example, I don't know, um, let's call it foo. So this one, just call it foo. This uh, this class feature categories, rename it to foo. Um, oh, the class? Yeah, yeah, yeah just, just to, to make the point. Yeah. Um, delete uh, de this one, the, the foo constant, yeah. Just oh, 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 oh. To the whole line. The whole line, yeah. Create, um, go below um, the foo class definition, like th at the end. And uh, yeah, and now uh, type uh, feature categories equals foo new load. This uh, is yeah. so basically from 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 the interf interface point of view, API point of view behaves in the same way you don't have to change any codes you've already done yep but from the from the um, from the internals you can still do unit testing to foo yep. or the name we came come up uh, soon maybe and then ruby modules and class names are constants mm -hmm. they are right. the same as constants got it would would you um would you prefer if this was, you know, screaming snake case. That seems less idiomatic. I like the other one seems like it's a class interface. You know, it's just uh, the fact that it's a class interface implies that it's persistent and you don't have to worry about anything at the instance. Got level. it. And that's what you were saying was classes are constants. OK, yeah, I'll, I'll try this out and um, I'll shoot this over to Bob and see what see what he thinks and I'll ping you all. So I'm going to change that back to. Yes, I will. Yep. I've, I've got to hop off right now, but this is super helpful. And I'm glad we figured out the around stuff. So before action wasn't working, around action seems to work. Now we have a unit test for it. I can actually get rid of a number of a bit of code um, that's not being used anymore now, which is great. Uh, so I really appreciate uh, your all help on this. Thank you so much. Right. And so the instance ordering stuff just went away because we went with this approach. Yep. Yep. All right. Hasta luego. Bye-bye.